if you haven't heard of Eddie before, if you haven't heard of his blog, Uncle Eddie's Theory Corner. It's really funny. You're going to fall in love with this guy because he is just passionate. And um, that's pretty much all I need to say. I mean, to let him say the rest for himself. So we'll just hear it from Eddie's mouth. Thank you, Eddie, for coming in and doing this interview with us. We're very excited to have you here. Let's get started with just a broad general question that we could go on for hours about. How does knowledge of music, poetry, and, and other forms of art and entertainment apply to animation? How does the knowledge of maybe Shakespeare or something like that apply to animation? Well, music, I'm sure, is absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know how to read music, so I can't do bar sheets, <laughs> right. things like that. So, uh, but I listen to a lot of it, like everybody does. And, uh, of course, you try to get a musical feeling into what you're doing. I, I always regard music as the queen of the arts. You know, it's, uh, it's a thing that all other arts aspire to because it goes right underneath your conscious level and, uh, and appeals to you in a direct way that a lot of other media can't. So you want whatever you're doing to approximate music, to, to slip in under the person's guard and go right to their inner mind and heart and um so far as shakespeare actually shakespeare's <laughs> shakespeare along with bob clampett <laughs> rod scribner and a few others is uh is one of the people i think most about uh believe it or not when i draw or, or tell stories or do anything in the media because uh shakespeare raised the bar for everything he uh it's beautiful speech beautiful cadences opportunities for acting uh a lot of stories fail because they don't have opportunities for acting. They don't lend themselves to acting. Awful lot of stories do that. But Shakespeare's is loved by actors because he they say, I always feel I'm grounded with Shakespeare. I know how to handle the situation because it's written into the lines. Mm -hmm. And uh I uh I ch <laughs> well it's <laughs> I mean, I've never achieved one atom of what Shakespeare achieved, but <laughs> I just I like to keep it in front of me to say that whatever I do has to be something that he would not roll his eyes up at. I mean, something that I have to be as good as Shakespeare. Or I'm a bum. I, uh, I'm not as good as Shakespeare. So that means I'm a bum. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, it's a different medium, so you don't quite Shakespeare's not really approached that way. And I think maybe most people don't wouldn't be interested in cartoons in the same way that they'd be interested in Shakespeare, looking for the same things, right? So maybe it's not quite the same. Well, it, I'm sure it's some of it's personal, but uh, you know, one of the things I learned from Shakespeare that I just use every day is uh, the importance of set pieces. Shakespeare, uh, if somebody's eating, nobody says pass the salt, will you? <laughs> it's got to be a set piece. You have to make something big about it. You know, the other person has to say, why? Why should I pass the salt? <laughs> Get it yourself. Then all of a sudden you've got a thing going. And uh, his plays tend to be one set piece after another with only small bridges between the set pieces. Whereas ordinary media is mostly filler with the occasional set piece, if you're lucky. Hmm. Uh, Shakespeare's all set pieces. And I I thought to myself, yeah, yeah, all set pieces. That's, he proves it's possible. A lot of other people say, oh, you can't have all meat and no potatoes. But his is all meat. It's just different kinds of meat. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's one of the things I learned from him. And I'm constantly referencing that sort of thing when I'm, when I'm working. What kind of music do you think applies to animation? We have a segment with, with uh, Skip and Steve, and they go over like some artists maybe people haven't heard about that apply to animation in different ways. Like, if, could you give an example of somebody that you really feel has like a, a strong impact on your on your work? Well, I tend to think of uh, because I'm in cartoons. I tend to think of Carl Stalling and what he would do. Uh, uh, it's amazing. Sometimes somebody will lean down to pick up a flower, and instead of uh, instead of normal uh, cute music or whatever you associate with flowers, beautiful music, there'll be something that denotes a storm brewing or something. <laughs> Sometimes he plays against what it is he's, he's doing. Mm. I've learned to do that too. And uh, since everything you know about music can apply to drawing and everything and staging and, and pacing, that uh, I tend to think, well, that must be true for acting then. I mean, if an actor or if a cartoon character leans down to pick up a flower, then 
surely, you know, uh, maybe maybe he needs to pick it up darkly <laughs> <laughs> to justify that kind of music. Of course, you wouldn't get that kind of music probably without Carl Stalling, but mm -hmm. Stalling uh, wasn't afraid to go against <clears throat> type. Uh, he uh, he was just constantly inventive, and I think that's uh, that's something you have to do in drawing. You, uh, if the way I look at it. Well, actually, there's a famous quote from uh, an early uh, computer guy named uh, Norbert Weiner, and he said, the more expected a piece of uh, a message is, the, le the less information it contains. So if you want the maximum information, which is what interests thinking people, and of course cartoon fans are thinking people, <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you have to throw the unexpected at them all the time. So... Once somebody looks at the ground and you know, and they're looking at a flower, and you know they're going to pick it up, uh, you're the the task before you is to say, how can I have them pick it up in a way that people don't expect? But since it's a minor thing, I mean, the real joke is coming after that. You don't want to spend too much attention with it. So, uh, how can I quickly do it in a way that's unexpected? Well, you might bring in a maybe he overshoots when he reaches down to pick up the flower. Maybe he uh, bends his elbow in an unpredicted way. The elbow is up and the hand is below the uh, level of the elbow. Maybe he keeps his legs straight and he just bows down at the waist. You want to keep it alive, and Stalling is the expert at that. And then I'm sure <clears throat> after Stalling... Oh, well, that's a long discussion, actually, the way Stalling worked, which I'm guessing at. I don't really know. Mm -hmm. Well, we can get into that. Yeah, go to. for it. We're not... Yeah, oh, okay. Not all day, yeah. <laughs> well... I, I don't know this for sure, but my guess is that the way things worked, at least in the Clampett unit, was that um, Clampett had a uh, Clampett would either go to Stalling's office or Stalling would come to his office. Clampett had a piano in his office. Stalling would sit down there, and uh, Clampett would say something like, uh, "Well, he'd run through the story, rough storyboard sketches on a corkboard, and." Uh, Stalling would say, "Oh yeah, I can. I know what to put there. How about how about something like this?" Clampett may have an idea. He might say, "Okay, Bugs is uh, he's in the water and he's swimming to this island, where he's he's going to turn around and do something to Fud." And uh, Stalling might say something like, "Well, you know, I can see something for that, like da 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 da." And Clampett will say, "Great, great. That's uh, that's wonderful. That fits the swim perfectly." But then Stalling might say something like. But you know, when you do that, you naturally just want to go up. Da -da 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 <laughs> it's just the way music is. It wants to go somewhere. So Clampett will say, oh, so he'll take a piece of pay scrap paper and draw a more energetic bug's pose for the swimming after the first one, which didn't exist in the story the way he originally pitched it, but which fits the music. And then... Uh, so they'll go on like that, sort of interacting with each other and Bob changing what he's doing to fit Stalling and vice versa. Then Stalling goes back and makes a, a better orchestration of it. Maybe does another piano version in a longer, in a more formal way or something. I'm not sure. But I, I like that uh, give and take with the, uh, with the composer. And I think today's method where the composer is brought in at the very end is... Uh, it's just totally wrong. I mean, uh, for the cartoons compo or for for film in general. Well, for cartoons and for film, I, I heard the norm. Well, I don't come to think of it. I don't know what the norm is, but the last two people who do that professionally that I was able to talk to personally said uh, they had both had two weeks to do the music for the film. They had a longer time to think about it, but they didn't know what shots they'd be getting. Mm -hmm. So it, it's given to them, sort of mostly edit it. You know, with a They'll finesse it a little bit after they get the music. But uh, I think, God, that's sad. I mean, uh, that's telling music is the queen or king of the arts. And here you are taking that special person and just treating him like he's an afterthought. <coughs> the, to me, the music guy is somebody that you bring in intermittently all through the project, all through the cartoon. And uh, you ask him are we missing anything? Are we missing an opportunity here for something cool? Or are we, so, do you have any suggestion about what to do here? And he might say, well, you know, if you gave the uh, the speech more of a cadence, 
which means a re-record. But mm -hmm. if you gave it more of a cadence in this thing, I could do this with it in the background. And like, holy cow, oh, man. <laughs> All right, let's see if we can afford to do that over again. And in animation, it's even worse than that. I mean, these people get essentially a, an animatic or something. It's already cut. And I'm thinking, <laughs> you don't... <laughs> You don't do that without uh, consulting your music guy. You know, even on the animatic, you consult your your music guy, which is why I think you need to have him in the studio and not, uh, you know, not at home somewhere. But uh, do you think that's because nowadays music isn't time to music so much as it? I mean, like a clampet cartoon would obviously dun 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 dun. You know, would very much be walking on beats and stuff. But typically, cartoons don't really do that anymore. I mean, do you? figure that's probably why they have the music come in later just oh, sort of throw probably. it on top but uh, to me cartoons are too talky now mm -hmm. uh, it may be fine if you have uh i don't know dawes butler or something but uh for an average voice talent they can't carry the musical weight of the film with their voice i mean voices are a type of music i suppose somebody who's really good at it could carry it without the music but uh most people require music. I'm a big believer in music and cartoons and doing the visuals to the music and sort of having a, a really rough pre-record that you, uh, where you've pitched the story to the musician and, and uh, to the guy who does the arrangements and, and makes the music. You come to some agreement about it, which is a little loose around the edges because it's not formally recorded yet. So there's, you know, you could still change this or that if one of the artists comes up with a better way of handling a situation than you expect it mm -hmm. but uh, I would never ever if the studio allowed would never ever uh, just hand over an animatic to a musician I think that's an insult are there any cartoons now that you think exemplify the kind of stuff that you're interested in like what kind of stuff do you watch now uh, so far as cartoons go sure uh, gee, to be honest, I watch uh, old <laughs> cartoons. <laughs> I mean, I watch whatever is necessary just to keep up with what's happening on TV and everything, because I might get a job on one of those shows. Right. But uh, when I'm doing it just for fun and having a good time, I always pull out the old, you know, I don't know, Warner Brothers Fleischer, things like that. Okay. But then let's talk about your technique for starting. You know, like if you're handed a scene... What, what format is that usually given to you? And is it just an outline at first? Well, am I, am I a director or a storyboard person in this scenario? In this scenario, you're, you're a storyboard person you're working with. Oh, so what do I do after I get it? Mm -hmm. uh, well, usually I get... Uh, I don't usually get just a scene in isolation. Maybe if you're working on a, a feature or something. But uh, in the, most of what I do is television. I only occasionally get to work on long, long length things. And on TV, they just hand you a whole act or a whole script. And uh, boy, uh, a lot of times I, <laughs> well, I uh, see, I believe that, uh, uh, I believe in artist driven projects. Uh, fortunately, there are artists who can write. So that uh, I'm, I'm a little bit, gee, I shouldn't say this because I'd like to continue working. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I, uh, I'm a little bit put off by it, but that, that doesn't last long. It's only a bit. Uh, because, uh, you know, I always think of casting. I mean, you have a crew with specific personalities and specific strong points. And if, if the director was running the show uh, and the director supervised the scripts rather than a story editor, then he would get a script which was tailor made for that unit. He'd say, he'd tell the, uh, you know, whoever's responsible for boarding it or writing it or something, uh, he'd say, hey, look, uh, remember that so and so does good chase scenes. So, you know, give me the kind of chase that he likes. Talk to him about it, you know, see what, he, see what he's into there. He has some really good techniques that we want to take advantage of. And, and so and so here does killer acting. So be sure you put a, a real act at sequence in there somewhere so he can get his teeth into it. He'll mm -hmm. do a good job. And <clears throat> so you would do that. But in modern uh, TV studios, you get a script 
which <laughs> from a writer you may never have talked to, <laughs> mm -hmm. who may not have any real animation interest. He just wants to go into live action, and this is a stepping stone. And you get it as a fait accompli. You know, uh, don't you dare touch a word. Don't delete. Don't <laughs> add. Don't do this. Don't do that. And uh, so when I say I, I, uh, I'm put off by it, I don't mean I'm put off by the idea of a, st of a story. I'm just put off by the fact that nobody thought I was worth consulting. And then nobody has to do anything, I suggest, but uh, the idea that nobody even wanted to talk to me. Especially as a story artist, right? Yeah. You're supposed to be. I mean, there's some things I do yeah. better than other things. Mm -hmm. And uh, since I'm working here, that would be a natural thing is to plug into that. Mm -hmm. But uh, the modern system, very few people, occasionally you get somebody who does. And those are the good, the better writers. But uh, normally you just get it as a fait accompli. It's, you know, don't, don't change a thing, just do what's there mm -hmm. and give it a little pizzazz. That's your mandate. Right. And uh, gee, I'd like to give it more than pizzazz. I'd like to make it something that I could watch, that you could watch 50 years from now and still get something out of mm -hmm. on a deadline, on a, you know, hit the, hit the deadline. So I get it, and usually I lose a day because the script is, uh, <laughs> is so uncinematic <laughs> that you have to psych yourself into doing it. You know, so I, I'm thinking about it all day long, certainly, and uh, you know, doing drawings and uh, on rough pa paper and so on, just trying to get a handle on it. And so usually I lose a day, even though I'm working all day. And uh, I usually start on it the second day. So I always have a day less than they tell you you're going to have because of my own uh, problems with things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I'm looking for is I never do it uh, in sequence. I always look for the I, I think to myself, what's the most what is the writer trying to say here? What is the most important scene in the film that's conveying what the story is about? And uh, I look for that, and when I find it, I spend that, a lot of that first day just thinking about it, and just coming up with ideas. I may even talk to other people about it. Even at lunchtime, you know, I might say, God, I have this thing, you know, I can't figure out uh, how to put something into it. It's, uh, I, but I know it's important. There's got to be something, you know. And uh, so anyway, <clears throat> but that's the most important thing, because yeah, it, presumably it's a scene that's going to motivate everything that happens in the cartoon, so you want it to be right. And uh, I'll just start on that because I figure you, you start from the scene or scenes that you know the public is going to love and that you're going to have a lot of fun with, and you expand outward from there. And if it takes longer than you think, then you have to shorten the rest of it. Mm -hmm. But that's what people pay their money for if, if they were paying customers. So you want to nail that and get something really good when you when you take it in order, when you start from the beginning and work your way through to the end, you're not paying attention to those set piece possibilities. Because I'm always thinking too, what, where can I put a set piece in here? Something that people will remember even if they forget everything else about the film. Sometimes, then the, the hard thing comes when you do think of something like that and that's killer, and you're really proud of it and then totally enthusiastic, and then you realize that that's a relatively minor part of the script. Here's where we pay for the artist and, uh, and writer not having communication. Mm -hmm. Because if, if I had talked to the writer while he was doing it, you know, he might have been able to finesse it a bit. But since I'm getting it just cold, um, then, you, then uh, you enter into difficulty because you, you can only spend so much time if there's other things that have to be done. Usually the scripts are way way long in TV. They're usually double the length. And uh, so they're cut a lot before they hit the screen. Mm -hmm. Actually, the writer should cut it down to length, but the writers don't talk to the artists that frequently. <laughs> they don't even know that we're going through this angst. Right. We would prefer to have a few good set pieces in a film that are really memorable and really well done. And the writer's thinking of... Uh, writer just adds a million characters that you don't need. They, uh, he has to tie up the loose ends, which means a lot of extra pages. Mm -hmm. Whereas the old Warner cartoons and so on used to fade out after the climax. Right. But writers rarely do that. They'll, 
there'll be the climax and then there'll be a long anti-climax and the anti-climax exists just to tie up all the loose ends for all these extra characters they stupidly add it well whose responsibility who i mean whose job is it to end up cutting the story who makes the decisions to say we do or we don't need this would that be you or does that fall in the director or? uh i well i pretend it's me while i'm doing it because i have more fun that way uh -huh. but in reality it's uh well, nowadays, uh, things have changed a bit. Uh, the position in modern TV uh, direct, of director is, uh, is not as strong as it used to be. Uh, I've seen flow charts on how to write books where the writer is explaining to new writers uh, what the flow of work in animation is. And they'll completely bypass the director. Mm -hmm. That's how unimportant he is in some studios. You know, so I'll get something and I'll say, oh, can I talk to the director about it? And they'll look at me curiously. Like, Why would you want to do that? <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> He's, uh, <laughs> oh, you mean the producer? <laughs> oh, oh, the God. producer. Yeah. Okay. Wow. <laughs> and uh, I tend to think of everything as directors like Clampett and Jones were, and that they, they call the shots and you're trying to please them. But it's a little ambiguous in uh, modern television. Really, we should go back to the director system where the director hires not only every single artist who works for him, but he hires the, uh, the writer as well. And uh, the writer, well, I guess the, ideally the artist it would be a, a writer artist, but if that's not possible, he at least hires the writer and actually could fire the writer if, if they came to blows. <laughs> right. So the writer feels some obligation to please the director. That only exists in a few places. That's not the norm. So thanks, Eddie, again, for coming out and doing that um, for us. We're going to have, like we mentioned before, plenty more episodes in the future with more stuff. Uh, Eddie's, Eddie's interviews went, went really well. And that one kind of cuts off in a weird place just because there was an interruption, and it doesn't actually come back in the same area. So we figured that would be a good place to cut it. So his next interview will start where that one left off.